Okay, so now we're talking about the idea of species. Now, again, this is where there's a difference of opinion in the past on whether species have formed from one species to another, evolving into a new species. That's up for debate. You can decide. I think we all know extinction is real if we believe that the fossil record is correct on the dinosaurs, because I haven't seen any roaming around since they closed down Jurassic World. That made it a lot easier for that. But uh, how are we affecting that? And I don't think there's any argument that we're affecting biodiversity. Uh, so there's a couple things that we can do. So how do they think species evolve if, they, if you believe that from one form to another? And one way it can be is, like we said, geographic isolation. If you have species, one member of the species go one way, one go the other, and they can't reproduce with each other for one way or another, whether it's the land mass is moving, or we have isolated them through our development, human development, or whether there was an earthquake that separated them, uh, and then you have uh, the reproduction has changed, the gene pool has been changed. This is an example that the fossil record shows that we believe here that the fox, foxes, the fox are able to survive in all kinds of different setups. And here they believe there was a fox population. Some of the members went north, some went south, and the ones that went north became more adapted for the cold and the ones that didn't, didn't. And they now are a new species. And you know you have two distinct species when you can't have fertile offspring. So they can't reproduce fertile offspring. There are species that you probably know of that can have non-fertile offspring, um, but that's not a new species because they can't reproduce their own selves. Uh, the mule is an example. I guess the liger, right? A combination of tiger and a lion. Very interesting. But the gray fox and the arctic fox are an example of, uh, we believe, a species that has uh, two species that have developed from one common ancestor. So there you go. An example of that. Right, what am I doing here? Okay. All right. So, um, yes, once the species is gone, they're gone forever until Jurassic Park and Jurassic World bring them back, I suppose. Um, but I had mentioned species that live in a very small area, and they're very susceptible to the extinction. And the name for those type of species is endemic species. So that's the endemic species. And they are particularly vulnerable. Okay, so do not make travel plans to go see the Golden Toad of Costa Rica because they're extinct. And uh, we'll talk in class about a lot of species that are extinct. The dodo bird, as well as the dinosaur, and the passenger pigeon you've read about. And um, very interesting uh, how that works. So uh, we'll talk about some of those stories in class as well. Okay, this extinction, according to the fossil record, happens anyway. It's uh, naturally occurring, and it's going to happen. And uh, the uh, theory is now we're in a period of mass extinction, where more species are becoming extinct. They're becoming extinct at more of a rapid rate. And uh, we're also, you know, people will tell you that we have something to do with that through the development and all the resources that we need uh, to support the exponentially growing population. Uh, but that's the difference between background extinctions and mass extinctions. They believe there have been mass extinctions in the past. You know, when a big asteroid hit, that's what the prevailing theory is about the dinosaurs being wiped out. Uh, you know, ice ages coming in. So they have the idea that this has happened before, but they also talk about the idea that there are times, uh, yes, where, where it has happened before, where there's been a large rate of extinctions. and. Uh, the belief is now that we're in one of those as well. We watch species go extinct. And we do know that we have something to do with that, with our development. A big something to do with that. Okay, now, the beliefs on the idea of evolution and whether different species have formed, again, as I said from the beginning, is, is up for debate. Some of this stuff is not up for debate. The peppered moths are not up for debate. So that idea of natural selection has validity. We know that. Um, now, this one becomes a very philosophical question as well, because we can control that change within populations. We can control extinction. We can have an effect on extinction, that's for sure. But we can also have organisms that we find valuable. We can make them to our liking more, more of an extent. And we've done this in the past. And we've done it with food, where we only plant the seeds of the members of the food that we like. We've changed through artificial selection, which tomatoes are going to be grown. Uh, you know, we've done that a lot once we discovered agriculture and how agriculture worked. 
So we've already done that. We've done that with dog species. You know, the dog is domesticated, of course. Dogs are wonderful pets. Uh, people enjoy that. I've had a couple of dogs that I've enjoyed. And what we've done is bred dogs for the traits that we like and created complete different uh, breeds of dog. You know, so different breeds, that's the genetic uh, traits of them. So they can still, they're still the species canine because they can produce together, but they look very different. And we have a, a large part to do with that. But now, if you want to talk about whether that should be done or that's ethical, <coughs> excuse me, we have also, with that uh, intellect that we have and that complex brain, ah, very nice, figured out how to genetically engineer uh, species as well. So we can get the qualities that we want by understanding the DNA that's going on and going in there manipulating it to be what we want it to be. And this is a fascinating uh, area of uh, discussion. And certainly people believe strongly on one side or the other. So there's a lot, a lot behind that. Do you want uh, genetically engineered mice? That's a possibility. Um, do you want food that's genetically engineered? Uh, these are these are interesting questions. GMOs, you know, are a big thing now. The GMOs, which are the genetically modified organisms, and some people don't want to eat the GMOs, and we don't know yet what the effects of all these things are. So we haven't quite uh, figured it out. Um, so should we be monkeying around with it? These are very interesting questions. They haven't really shown that GMOs are are dangerous to you health-wise. Not at the making of this video, and to my knowledge, but they will remove GMOs from products because of the consumer feeling about it. I enjoy Cheerios. And uh, a couple years ago, they said that, uh, you know, they're now GMO-free. Uh, nothing GMO is going into it. And uh, they don't taste any different to me, but um, very interesting that that's, uh, that's going about. Okay, so how about species diversity and why do we care about having all these different species? This is also part of the worldview. Do we care if a species goes extinct as we're developing, if we feel that we needed that land or that resource, or do we feel that species all have a right to uh, exist uh, and that we shouldn't be doing that? That's an interesting question in itself. It depends on your worldview, right? And uh, sometimes that becomes economical and environmental, the, the discussion and those things and seeing how they're connected. Uh, but how about the spe species diversity? Why would we care about this? Well, there's a few ways of measuring species diversity, and one is richness and one is even evenness. And the idea of uh, richness is how many different species that you have. So do you have a, a ecosystem where you have lots and lots of species? That would be richness, species richness. And if you're low on the spe species richness, then you are uh, you don't have as many species in that area. Species evenness is how they're balanced out. You know, are there equal numbers of each one? Are some species predominant and there's only a few members of the other one? Are there, you know, this, this is the idea of evenness. And these two things together go into biodiversity. And by looking at the richness and the evenness and plugging it into some mathematical formulas, they come up with what's called a biodiversity index. So a high number on your biodiversity index means you're very biodiverse, and a lower number means you're less biodiverse. So there are areas that are very rich in uh, species, tropical forests, the coral reefs, the ocean bottom. There's an interesting place. Why would the ocean bottom? That seems the bottom of the deep blue sea. Why would that be diverse? Well, there's something that gets down there to the bottom of the ocean, and that's all the nutrients. Gravity will bring it down through the water eventually. And all this stuff floating down into the bottom of the ocean, they call it marine snow. So there's actually a lot of nutrients down there. When there's a lot of nutrients, you can have a lot of life. Uh, large tropical lakes also have some biodiversity, and usually some that are uh, dangerous for human beings. You picture slithering snakes and crocodiles, and lots of diversity. Okay, so here is an idea of richness on the left. You're looking at a bunch of different species, very colorful, underwater. Uh, and then on the right, you're looking at it where it's just evenness with the species, where there's lots of uh, one particular species there. That's very even, but not very rich. And the other side is rich, but uh, you'd have to do some calculations to figure out how even it is, if there's dominating species. But there's a richness and evenness for you there.
Okay, the idea of uh, richness on islands, well, this is the island theory. And the idea with the island theory is that the bigger the island, the more species you're going to have. And the closer to the mainland, the more species you're going to have because there can be travel back and forth from the mainland to the island. So a small island would have uh, low richness and, uh, and, um, and, an, uh, and, uh, and an island that was closer by would have uh, bigger richness, large richness larger richness, more biodiversity. Um, okay, so that's the idea there. And also the idea that the larger the island, the more life it can support, and the closer to the mainland, the more there will be a uh, immigration and emigration. And this lets us start talking about how in species, and then we can relate it to human population, start moving from one area to the other. So the idea with the island theory is that immigration and extinction kind of balance each other out. When one void is there because one species is left, another one will come in and it balances out. So that's the idea of the island theories anyway. Okay, so the richness uh, with more species in an area to have to take on more different roles seems to be that's more sustainable. There's biodiversity there. Uh, that's one thing. And um, the question is, how much do you need to keep that happening? So there's a lot of debate on what our action should be given the idea of species richness and whether we want to preserve the biodiversity, especially for areas that have lots of endemic species, there's a big question because we don't really know what those species are all about maybe, and if we choose to develop in those areas, we're going we're gonna to wipe them out before we know about them, uh, possibly. So there's uh, solutions and challenges to be thinking about there. But in general, the more richness, the more sustainable the uh, the system is. Okay, so let's talk about what's going on there. Why do we need these different species? Well, there's a thing called a niche, uh, you know, a niche or a niche, N-I-C-H-E. And the idea in nature there is how do you live, what foods do you eat, what is your role in the ecosystem, that's your niche. And when these niches overlap, species are going to fight it out for uh, survival. Even within the species, they're going to fight for those resources or fight to have that role. And uh, that depends on what the carrying capacity is and what the resources available are to support the life is. But it's a constant struggle for finding your niche. Uh, and humans do it too, right? We find our niche. Some of us become high school teachers. That's a little bit of my niche. All right, so a generalist species is, um, they are, they can take on a lot of different roles in a lot of different locations, and they're not in just one small area. So a generalist species has a broad niche, and a specialist uh, is confined to a small little role uh, in the environment. All right, so here's the idea of the species here, and here are two species, and the panda has a very narrow uh, niche, and raccoons you can find everywhere. I've seen them from Florida to uh, up in Maine, and... Uh, you know, lots of other places too. And if I went further south or further north, I'm sure I'd keep seeing raccoons. They're very much a generalist. They have some things that are overlapping here, but they uh, have very different niches and a very small niche uh, for the panda bear. Right? So it's a large one. So generalist and specialist. We well, guess which one's the generalist. <laughs> you know, that would be the raccoon, and the panda is the specialist. All right, so we did a little study about these cockroaches. They are very, very successful, living in a lot of different areas. And the, another thing about these generalists is uh, oftentimes they reproduce often and with many, many offspring. So they're continually uh, growing, and it's hard to wipe them out because they can reproduce so quickly. Specialists, on the other hand, uh, don't produce as quickly and uh, they're more susceptible to this idea of extinction, or envi environmental pressures that we're putting on them as well, uh, lack of resources. Okay, so the cockroach. Whew. Well, I lived in Florida for a little while, and they got cockroaches down there with wings, those palmetto bugs. Those things fly at you. Those, those things are pretty, pretty hardy, pretty crazy. So cockroaches, there you go. All right, I love going down to the ocean. <clears throat> you know, when I live down in Florida, and when I live here in New Jersey, the ocean being so close is so nice. You know, about 80% of the population lives uh, very close to the ocean. That would be us, too. We live close to the ocean here in Monroe. But I like going down there and watching the wildlife down there, and it's just amazing. But here in just, it's at, it's the beach, right? So in the beach, there are different species that are going to be adapted in different ways, and it's amazing the adaptations that they have. Here the brown pelican they have, 
brown pelican is a good predator down south and, and farther up north too. Sometimes you see them in New Jersey. In New Jersey, the big predator for us is the osprey. The, uh, that's like the hawk of the water. It's like a water hawk, the osprey, and just beautiful. And they, you can see them down at the Jersey Shore. When they dive into the water, they mean business, and oftentimes they're coming up with a fish. So they're, they're pretty good at all that. Uh, higher up the food chain, they eat some, uh, some bigger fish. So, all right, let's see here. I'm going to pause for a second. All right, all right. well, um, so back to the video here. Sorry for that interruption. But just amazing down there, and they've split it up, and, and we would say adapted over time. Some birds adapted so that their beaks are going to be longer, and, you know, the web feed is an adaptation, and the duck uh, get the ability to swim and dive underwater for a while. It's just crazy. And these gull scavengers out there, too, are just, there's so many different types of seagulls that you could talk about. Or maybe you could say it's one type of, uh, that seagulls are just a broad category, but they're all uh, prevalent along the seashores, and their scavengers will just pick up a lot of things. So they have their niche in there, too. Fascinating. All right, so um, then there's the idea of species that are existing in an area, and they would be the native species, so they're there, and that's how the ecosystem is running. And then what happens when other species come in? Those are invasive species, or exotic species, or introduced species. And I think it really depends on whether they are useful or not, how we say that, or we think they're pretty. But uh, some of them come in, and then they just really are able to take over uh, an environment a new environment and so now your invasive species is taken over and we'll talk a lot of examples of invasive species your book will and we will as well in class because uh, that's a big thing and also because we as human beings are able to introduce species to different areas too and uh, that becomes our role in changing what these ecosystems are like and what species are going to be there so it's very very interesting some are useful some are not and I think when they're not we start calling them invasive species and then, uh, other than that, we might call them the introduced species. Okay, there are other species uh, that we like to talk about, and these are indicator species. So maybe uh, these species have a low range of tolerance. So when there are problems with these species, we're like, that's the start of it. And then other species, if we continue, if the changes continue the way they're happening, uh, could be affected. But these are indicator species, and we list a few for you there. Uh, the frogs, especially because their skin uh, can absorb so much of what's going on around them, uh, they are suscept susceptible to a lot of troubles, and they're an indicator species. So you see a few of them there. The old canary in a coal mine uh, story that, uh, you know, humans would use canaries in the coal mine because the canaries would die if the air quality was poor before the people would, and that told the people it was time to get out. So that's the idea of the indicator species. All right, a keystone species, you know, a keystone in architecture is the stone at the top of an arc. And people have been so clever with architecture to figure that out, you know, even hundreds of, well, thousands of years ago. But the keystone is a stone that if it's not there in the arc, the whole thing falls apart. So a keystone species is a species in an ecosystem that if it's not there, the whole ecosystem is going to have some problems. So a top predator is going to be one because then the prey will just go run rampant. And when they run rampant, they're going to maybe knock out the uh, what the producers are doing too quickly. And that will change the whole deal. Without pollinators, this is why we're concerned with uh, honeybees. We're not going to have plants growing. And without plants, there's no food chains. And there you go. Foundation species are species that change the environment a little so other species could live there. Um, you know, beavers changing the dam give other, you know, damming the river give other species a chance to live where they wouldn't have before. They're creating homes for them. Um, foundation species are often keystone species because they help out. And, uh, and there we go. Okay, so how about sharks? Why do we want to be protecting sharks? Ever since uh, we got Shark Week now and Shark NATO, people have a big fear of sharks. Well, the idea with sharks is they've been around for a long time, and they've been very successful of hanging around uh, for a long time. So maybe we could learn something from them if we want to hang out. Human beings want to uh, be on the planet sustainably for as long as sharks uh, have. They su uh, suggest that there's medical things that we could learn from sharks. They don't seem to get cancer. So maybe that can give us a clue to how we can eradicate cancer at one point or another. 
uh, but also within the ecosystem. Sharks are a top predator, so if they are not there doing their job, the whole thing can fall apart. There can be a, the prey is going to grow up, they're gonna, their, their species is going to go too high, uh, and then there's going to be the lower levels are going to be out hunted, and then once they're gone, it won't be able to support uh, the prey that is now higher up the food chain or not worried about its predator shark, and that can change the whole dynamic of it. So sharks are pretty important for that. We're afraid of them, uh, but you got to respect them a little bit, having been around so long, and they pretty much perfected what they do, and uh, they don't really interfere with us all that much, but when they do, it's pretty dramatic, and it's scary to us, and uh, so they seem to get uh, people like catching the sharks. We've tried to protect them a little bit more now that we understand a little bit more what's going on. I blamed the movie Jaws a little bit. That movie scared me. I didn't go out hunting sharks, but I could understand it after that. I was... I was quite frightened for a while. I stayed out of the ocean for an entire summer. Well, that's the end of this video. So I hope you found this helpful. And if you have any questions from it, please feel free to bring them back into class. And I will look forward to seeing you there.